Welcome to our lecture series on lipids. Here we will learn about the basic structure and function of steroid lipids in biological systems. A steroid is a terpenoid lipid characterized by a carbon skeleton with four fused rings, generally arranged in a 6 6 6 5 fashion. Steroids vary by the functional groups attached to these rings and the oxidation state of the rings. Hundreds of distinct steroids are found in plants, animals, and fungi. All steroids are made in cells either from the sterol lanosterol in animals and fungi or the sterol cycloartanol in plants. This is the structure of cholestane, a steroid with 27 carbon atoms. Its core ring system, A, B, C, D, is composed of 17 carbon atoms, is shown with the IUPAC approved ring lettering and atom numbering. You do not need to memorize the ring numbering. It's here for a reference. Steroids are considered to be terpenoids due to the building blocks and modifications required for their biosynthesis. Terpenes are one of the largest classes of natural products. Their building block is the five carbon isoprene unit which are assembled to each other in thousands of different ways to yield unique products. In the phospholipid section, you are introduced to the farnesyl and geranyl geranyl hydrocarbon tails that are added onto peripheral membrane proteins to help tether them to the plasma membrane. Both of these hydrocarbons are examples of terpenes. Terpenoids are compounds related to terpenes which may include some oxygen functionality or some rearrangements of the original terpene bonds. As terpenoids, steroids are built from the five carbon isoprene units. In the first step, the isoprene building blocks are activated to the diphosphate intermediates, dimethylallyl pyrophosphate, DMAPP, and isopentanyl pyrophosphate, IPP. The IPP subunit is transferred to the DMAP, forming geranyl pyrophosphate, GPP. Another isoprene unit is transferred to the geranyl pyrophosphate to yield the 15-carbon intermediate farnesyl pyrophosphate, FPP. Two farnesyl pyrophosphates are then joined to yield the 30-carbon precursor squalene. Squalene is then oxidized to an epoxide and undergoes cyclization reactions to produce the A, B, C, and D steroid ring structures. Within plants, cycloartanol is formed and serves as the core steroid structure that all others are produced from. In fungi and animals, the 2,3-oxidosqualene is cyclized to lanosterol. Fungi convert this to ergosterol and animals to cholesterol. In animals, cholesterol then serves as the backbone for the synthesis of the other steroids. Cholesterol is the most abundant steroid in animals. It is also classified as a sterol due to the hydroxyl located at the C3 position. The hydroxyl makes cholesterol weakly amphipathic. The ring structures make cholesterol very rigid, and when it's inserted into the plasma membrane, it increases the melting temperature of the structure. Cholesterol is synthesized in the liver or taken up in the diet. As a sterol, it is a highly hydrophobic substance. Its transport between organelles requires transport carriers, both vesicular, membrane-based, and non-vesicular, protein-based, transport are involved in the intracellular transport of sterols. Chylomicron structures, which we will discuss in further detail, are used to transport cholesterol between cells. Cholesterol is also part of the plasma membrane. The content of cholesterol present in the plasma membrane helps to determine the rigidity and flexibility of the membrane, specifically the planar nature of cholesterol and the inflexibility of the ring structure cause cholesterol to increase plasma membrane rigidity and give higher melting temperatures. The placement of cholesterol within the membrane is not uniform. Higher levels of cholesterol are found in lipid raft regions and can be associated with increased risk for disease states or disease aggressiveness. During the development of breast cancer, a common protein that becomes mutated or overexpressed 
is the tyrosine kinase receptor, herb B2. During cancer, this protein becomes upregulated and turned on all the time, causing the activation of growth stimulatory pathways. Note that we have seen some of these common players before in the insulin signaling cascade. This dysregulation leads to uninhibited growth of the tumor. The therapeutic drug, trastuzumab, is a monoclonal antibody designed to target herb B2. Lapatinib is another treatment option. It is a tyrosine kinase inhibitor that blocks the signaling of the herb B2 pathway. So how does all this relate back to cholesterol levels within the plasma membrane? With herb B2 positive breast cancer, the herb B2 is overexpressed and found in lipid raft areas with heightened levels of cholesterol present. These lipid rafts are very rigid. Researchers have speculated that the rigidity of the lipid rafts within the system contribute to the aggressiveness and ability of the tumor to develop resistance to treatment. One strategy during treatment is to try and hit the tumor with multiple agents to cause a catastrophic or apoptotic death of the tumor cells. In this experiment, the researchers wanted to determine if there were any synergistic effects by treating the tumor cells with a combination of lapatinib, the tyrosine kinase inhibitor, and lovastatin, a cholesterol-lowering drug. Lovastatin works by inhibiting the HMG-CoA reductase enzyme required for the synthesis of the cholesterol in liver. Lapatinib inhibits the tyrosine kinases. Researchers in this study used a mouse xenograft model where human breast cancer cells were implanted in the mice. The mice were then either treated with lapatinib alone, lapatinib plus lovastatin, or left untreated. In this model system, dual treatment was found to reduce cholesterol levels in the membrane, increase membrane fluidity, and increase the rates of ERB2 receptor endocytosis and degradation. In the xenograft model, this correlated with reduced tumor size following treatment. Thus, while cholesterol does not directly mediate cell signaling functions, it can indirectly affect the activity of the protein receptors and cellular processes such as endocytosis. The role of cholesterol in the body is not limited to its function in the plasma membrane. Cholesterol is also the precursor for the development of all other steroids in the body. Many of those steroids serve as hormones and are involved in cellular communication and signaling pathways. The first part of the steroidogenesis pathway involves the biosynthesis of progesterone, 17-alpha-hydroxypregnenolone, and 17-alpha-hydroxyprogesterone. These can serve as hormone signaling molecules directly or by being further converted into androgens, glucocorticoids, mineral corticoids, and estrogens. The glucocorticoids are involved in the fight-or-flight stress response within the body. In response to stress, cortisol is released from the adrenal glands located above the kidneys. It has pleiotropic effects on the body. For example, it activates glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis processes in the liver as well as lipolysis in adipose tissue. The net effect is to increase glucose concentrations in the blood. Cortisol also prevents the release of substances that cause inflammation. If present chronically, it can weaken the immune system and reduce bone formation, leading to osteoporosis. There are a myriad of other effects associated with cortisol that would take the rest of this term to fully tease apart, so we will leave it there. In addition to the glucocorticoids, metabolism of progesterone can also lead to the production of the mineral corticoids, such as aldosterone. Aldosterone is essential for sodium conservation in the kidney. Pregnenolone and progesterone metabolism also lead to the production of the androgens and estrogens. These are necessary for normal sexual development and play a role in healthy aging and longevity. Cholesterol is also a precursor for the synthesis of bile acids. Bile acids are transformed to bile salts with their association with sodium or potassium ions. Bile acids are synthesized in the liver 
and transferred to the gallbladder for storage. From there, they are released into the small intestine, where they aid in the metabolism of lipids consumed in the diet. Once in the small intestine, microbes can transform bile acids into secondary bile acids. The pool of bile acids and bile salts can then be used for digestion or transported and reabsorbed through the enterohepatic circulation or excreted. Bile acids can further be modified by the addition of taurine or glycine. Overall, these modifications make bile salts more amphipathic. In the core structure, the hydrophilic portions of the molecule are localized to one face, whereas the hydrophobic portions are facing the other side. The hydrophobic portions are shown in yellow, and the hydrophilic portions are shown in blue. The amphipathic nature of the bile salts enables them to aid in lipid digestion. Bile salts can surround the hydrophobic lipid core, shielding it from the hydrophilic water environment. This allows bile acids and salts to emulsify the lipid consumed in the diet so that they are suspended in small droplets of fat within the small intestine. This creates higher surface area of the fat so that lipase enzymes can more efficiently break them down. In the next section, we will look more closely at the process of lipid digestion.